Thank you for that. Um, if I can now uh, introduce Zev Fisher again, the uh, CEO of Pakama, who will be speaking about IP services, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Hi again. Um, so starting with an apology to the gentleman uh, from Marks and Clerk who thought that we almost criticized patent attorneys uh, in our panel. Um, we will surely be, I'll, I'll surely criticize patent attorneys now just to make sure that <laughs> I've not just almost done it. Um, okay, so um, let's, um, let's try and, and um, so for those of you who are, who are patent attorneys in private practice, this is, this is trying to look at patents and trademarks uh, from the user's perspective, so from the, the IP owner's perspective. Um, and and it, it roughly looks like, the, like this, uh, having had many conversations with people. Um, there is an idea, and hopefully this thing would work, and move on to the next level. No? Well, that's it, there is an idea. <laughs> no patent, no anything. Oh, okay. There is no uh, one now. There's a black box, and I really hope that if I keep clicking it, is there another way maybe to move slides? It's not really moving. Well, that's it then. Oh, okay, that's nice. Um, and two things come out of uh, uh, of that black box: how much it costs and what is the deadline. That's what uh, IP owners know and see. Um, they know how much it costs and they know what's the deadline. They know it's very urgent uh, because everything else has been put aside uh, at this point when it's very urgent. And trying again. So I think that maybe, th maybe if I open the laptop. No. So can I have the next one then? Okay, so let's talk about the good things in this uh, process. Next slide, please. Oh, okay. So, uh, uh, patent attorneys are, th are the good thing. So, the, the criticism is on its way, but he here, are, here are all the good things. Um, patent attorneys are fantastic. I've been working with patent attorneys all of my, uh, all of my, my career, and they, they have I, I, th I just think they're fantastic. They're great. I mean, they, they get it. Most of them in this country have a PhD. They understand the science. Uh, uh, many of them are, are really exceptionally competent. And there is no one better who can draft uh, a, a patent application than a patent attorney. So th this is a great thing that really works well. And, and I think that the good news is that it's not going to be replaced by AI um, anytime soon because the AI might get bored. Um, <laughs> ne next slide, please. Thank you. They also don't miss the deadline, um, wh which, is not, um, uh, which is not to be taken for granted. Uh, we, don't want, uh, uh, we don't want deadlines missed. Deadline mi mi deadlines missed are, are notifications to the insurance company, um, our, our attention at the office. Uh, it's, it's just not good, and, and from a company's perspective, deadline, deadline miss is something that one needs to report to their investors. It, it's just not nice, and it's great to have the structure of, a, of an IP firm in place to make sure that the de deadline is not missed. So this, this two, these two things are done really, really well uh, in, in this industry. However, <laughs> moving to the bad, um, can, can you roll it on a little bit more? The, the, the animation is upside down. Another one? Okay. So what do they, what, what do they, not, do they don't do very well? Um, so businesses, and I've, I've, had, um, I've had the pleasure of moving from uh, private practice to running uh, a, a software company. Um, so uh, uh, this, is all, uh, this is all learned from painful lessons. This is what uh, business, uh, businesses need. Um, they need to know what they have. So if it's IP, which IP rights do I have? They don't need to know it all the time. They only need to know it when they're fundraising or that when they're having a board meeting. So what do I have and what's the status? Um, sounds simple, but uh, I've, we've had Gonzalo before. I've seen uh, maybe 15, uh, there are 15 last companies that went through fundraising. 
uh, came with uh, reports of what IP do their businesses have, and they all look different, and they all look awful. So, uh, some of them are email, some of them is an Excel sheet, but group them by families. That's not too much to ask. Um, what is the number, when, they were, when the, were they filed, what's the cu current status? Sounds quite basic, but, but actually, most businesses don't have access to this on, on all the time, and uh, many businesses don't ever have access to a proper list of what actually I IP rights they have. Then what do I need to do? Well, what do I have, what do I need to do? What's, what do you need from me? Um, and, uh, and then how much is it going to cost? So fairly straightforward when it's a, a, a response needs to be drafted, there's a, a, there is the, the communication that came in, and uh, you can get a, a, in some firms a quote, in some other firms an estimate, it's pretty clear and straightforward. But tell me what my budget's going to be in the next year or two. And there you go into a whole minefield of, of uncertainty and complication. Um, so these are the things that businesses need. Um, what do they get? They get individual emails on individual cases. He hereby, please be informed that your application has been published. <laughs> what application? Where? In China. Great. Which patent? Okay, there is a, there is a name. What does that mean? So it's been published. So what? And what do I need to do anything? Um, no, you don't need to do anything. Oh, great. So why are you telling me this? Well, uh, you, you need to know. <laughs> no, I don't. And, uh, um, and emails, e emails on in, in individual cases as how case management systems, or as our American friends call them, docketing systems, are set, out, set up to not miss any, any report that patent firms believe that their clients need to know. But fr from the client's perspective, it's noise. From the IP owner's perspective, getting more and more and more emails in some firms coming with a bill that they need to send to processing, and the bill can be 50 pounds, but it still needs to be processed by their accounting department, and a reminder that the bill has not been paid, is noise. They don't need that. What they need is one big list and telling them what they have and what they need to do. The other thing is access to their files. So I had this really interesting conversation outside uh, with a firm that has set up a client portal, which is extremely advanced. I think it's the firm that Gold sponsors this event. So well done um, for setting up a client portal. And uh, um, uh, not all clients are using this portal to be soft. Um, but the point is, it's like knowing what you have. The point with having a client portal or having a access to your, to your files is not using it. It's like an insurance policy. You want to have access to your files and because they're yours. If you have patents and you have trademarks, you want to be, to be able to take these patents and trademarks at any given point of time and give them to whoever, whomever you want, just like you do with any other important asset. Um, and and in, in the vast majority of firms, yes, you can say, please send me my files and you'll get them on a, on a uh, um, now, I guess, Dropbox shared folder after two weeks with a bill. Um, but that's not what you want. You want access to your files every day, all day, all the time. Then uh, um, that touches on visibility. I mean, again, no, no one big list of what do I have and what do I need to do, which sounds fairly simple, but nobody's getting it. Um, then on budgeting, um, I, I use the term padded guesses because that's what people, so people say, how much is my IP going to cost me? And I, I, hear, I, I hear something along the lines of, well, assume £20,000 for the next year for every patent. Or something, you know, things, things along these lines. Can it be 10? Can it be 5? Can it be 40? Yes. Probably not 40 because what, what, uh, what, what actually happens is that if, if uh, uh, patent firms are really forced to do that, they will go through every file, try and try to guess whether a communication is expected in the next um, year or so on a bespoke ad hoc basis. And every time they do that exercise, they'll be guessing and then doubling the figure just in case. Um, and that's, um, that's not what businesses need. That's the only thing that, that patent firms are able to produce. 
Um, and uh, uh, the last the last thing is that clients clients get uh, or IP owners get foreign firms that they have, they don't know. So they, they don't know who the firm in China is. They don't know who the firm in the U.S. They don't know who the firm in Japan is. They, they just have no idea who these people are. They're relying on a relationship. And if I have a little bit of time, I'll talk a bit about relying and about relationship. Um, but uh, in in essence, sorry, I'm. Well, yeah, fine, you can show that, but I'm still talking a bit. <laughs> uh, can one one back? Thank you. Yeah, we're not we're not here yet, but you can have a look at the picture. Um, so, uh, w with foreign firms, our friends in Japan and and some in Germany have, have figured out a long time ago that the people doing your work in Japan and in China and in the U.S. and in other countries are important. And if they are important, you need to know who they are. Now, this is not to say that um, the, the, rela the people picked based on the relationship created on a nice drink on INTA or AIPPI 20 years ago is not a good firm. It just means that you need to know who they are because it's important. They're doing an important job for you. And uh, what people get are firms that they don't know. They don't know why they're charging the way they're charging and they, know they don't know whether their prices are reasonable. They don't know if the job is any good they, because they don't read Chinese. And, and I would argue that most of the IP firms don't reverse translate everything they do once every six months for supervision purposes. So that's what people get. And, and, um, and that's pretty bad because it means that patent attorneys are aces, but the main thing that patent firms do is supply patent attorneys and, don't, and make sure they don't miss the deadline. And that comes at cost. Now we can move on to the next slide. Um, so an ace patent attorney, uh, that, that's fine, uh, an ace patent attorney makes about £85,000 a year. So obviously, some, many, it's not the people in this room, the people in this room are very senior, so they're making much more. But I, I'm sure that you will all agree with me that £85,000 a year is a reasonable salary, and that's the average salary of an experienced patent attorney in this country. Uh, divided by 12 months, 22 days uh, uh, a, uh, of work days uh, a month and six, uh, hours of work every day, that comes to £53 per hour. That is the real cost of an experienced patent attorney. Now, I challenge you to find me one that would charge £53 or £60 or £70 or £100 an hour. That is going to be very difficult for most IP owners, but that is the real cost. And it's very important to understand that what IP owners are paying for not missing the deadline, well, that's actually not true, for getting access to patent attorneys is the multiplication of five on their real cost. It's very important to understand that. And then you get, um, I think in some firms, £375 per hour uh, if, if they're really kind of pushing it on paralegal time. Um, and no, no, we're still there. Um, on paralegal time, and um, I, I, I'll give some time for questions. Uh, and uh, um, um, sometimes it's significantly less, but it's uh, the, the average paralegal in the UK costs 25,000 to 30,000 pounds a year, and you can do the same math, it's even worse uh, than what it comes, and, and um, some uh, benchmark on foreign associate charges. And the beauty of this is that this happens on the foreign associate level as well. So the foreign associates that you don't know because you trust your patent attorneys to, to pick the ones they met on INTA, are even worse. They're charging their highest, the f highest fees they can possibly charge because they know they'll get the work anyway. Now we can carry on to the next slide. Yeah, yeah. next one. Yeah, another one. Thank you. And and why why does that happen? So, it's actually not the patent attorneys in for private practice's fault at all. Um, you. you and, and I think this is kind of uh, my my younger brother is has the, has some you know these socialist views on the world, and we have arguments uh, in the family about you know whether it's human nature or uh, you know these these sort of things. But um, if people can charge a lot, they will charge a lot. That's fine. That's business. And and IP owners should charge a lot for their products as much as they possibly can. Yeah, I'll be fine in five minutes. Um, and, um, uh, and the truth, and the, perhaps the sad truth, truth is that 
uh, IP owners are so busy with sales and marketing and all sorts of other things that you need to do when you run a company that IP is, is not the first thing on their desk. And when it becomes important enough for them, they hire an in-house department. And, and the in-house patent attorney does what gets to know the foreign patent attorneys, benchmarks the prices, checks all of these things, and then things start making sense. The um, uh, in-house, uh, the, the client, the, the IP owner that doesn't have an in-house department, they build a relationship and they trust their patent attorneys. And uh, um, so in, in effect, that means that they don't supervise anything they do at all, ever. Um, then uh, patent attorneys rely on legacy systems. And that's a, uh, having tried to sell new systems to patent attorneys in the last two years, I know it's impossible. So it's just they, they never buy anything. You know, there is a partner committee that makes decisions and they never decide anything, um, especially not to buy a new IT system. There's an IT director whose job depends on never changing anything. Um, so, um, so they don't buy anything new, but the legacy systems are expensive. And that's where, where some of the cost comes in. It's not just the systems themselves, it's the inefficient processes that undermine them. And then they don't know how to measure things. So patent firms don't know how to find better foreign associates. They just have no mechanism to do that. The, the only mechanism to find foreign firms and work with them is go to Inter again and meet more people and send them another case and see how it goes. And there is no other way. Um, you can ask a friend but that's, you know, that's kind of how we've done things and, and, and 50 or 100 years ago. And they are proud of it. You know, we've done this 100 years and that works for us. Of course it does because clients are willing to pay for it. So it's really not the patent attorney's fault. They're wired in a certain way. They're making a lot of money. They're doing really, really well. And there is absolutely no problem for them to solve. So I, you know, having, having worked with patent attorneys for some time, I no longer have the expectations that, that they will do anything to change their ways. However, it's the, the IP owners are crazy that they're not demanding more. And why are IP owners, and some of us sitting here, not uh, accepting this, not shopping for prices, not uh, asking to know uh, who the uh, foreign associates are, and are demanding more efficiency? And the answer is, again, the, because unfortunately IP is not the first thing on their desk. So I guess the, the main take here is IP is not so important and that's a great thing for the patent attorney's profession. Um, I don't know if there's anything, uh, yeah. So uh, what, what, are we, uh, uh, what are we ending up uh, with? Uh, uh, most of the, most of the uh, IP owners that don't have an IP department uh, have a poor process of internal management of IP. Uh, their external management of IP uh, comes to meeting the deadline or not meeting the deadline. Um, and that's usually it. Uh, investors uh, are uh, playing ball with this because they have no means of checking anyone's IP. And I know that because I'm checking IP for investors and I know that uh, uh, the only thing they look at is whether the status is correct and whether the assignments have been recorded. Later stage investors will check the IP but it will be way, way too late and also not deeply enough. And uh, um, IP owners face costs that are really not necessary if the whole industry moved forward. And IP firms are quite difficult to operate because they're never getting any new piece of software. And that's what makes things, uh, especially something that is structured and as procedural as running an IP firm, that's what would have made it more efficient. But it's not possible because there are so many millionaires sitting in, uh, in the partners meeting not wanting any change. Um, so that is the grim uh, result uh, of all of this. Um, yeah, so w having worked in this space for uh, quite some time now, the refreshing thing uh, that we see from our perspective, so we build software uh, that's used by both IP owners and IP firms, is that IP owners are waking up. So in some jurisdictions, they've already woken up. And uh, the, the Samsungs of the world wouldn't let you do anything. And luckily for the industry in this country, most of the clients are not like the Samsungs of the world um, because they know, they know their stuff. Um, and, uh, but, but IP owners are waking up to the reality and uh, if we can uh, do one more slide, uh, can we please move? Yeah, that's <laughs> us. Uh, and another one? Thank you. So um, 
you could say, and this is this is being uh, um, you know this is being sort of wishful thinking, but you, you could say that from an IP firm's perspective, if you are if your management structure is such that allows you to make any decisions, uh, you could want to consider that, if, that at some point of time the world will change, and when it does change, you would have wanted to change before that. Um, maybe not. Maybe you've retired by then and sitting next to your swimming pool, and you really don't care. But if you're young enough and partnery, senior partnery enough, uh, maybe a, now is the time when you want to start thinking about how to uh, improve the, the way your firm works from a technolo technological perspective. From an IP owner's perspective, I say, you are the ones who are going to drive any change in this industry. So uh, um, ask your patent attorneys for more. If you, don't want, if you don't know how to do that, come to someone who does. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, do we have time for questions? Two questions? You wanted to ask something. Yes, thank you. Oh, and it's on. Um, I, I'm not a patent attorney, so I feel um, I can slightly defend them um, I in mean, one respect and challenge some of your mathematics. Because when you take the example of £85,000 and you take the normal British accounting method that the salary of any individual is actually only one third of the true cost to the business, you're underestimating when you break it down to that point by at least a third, which would take you up to just under £160. And that's assuming that it is six hours of productivity and there's none time spent on the free consultations that client requests, the, the capped fees and, and other structures. So I, I don't doubt that you can break these things down, but I think it's a little unfair to the patent attorney profession to break them down the way you did because you're not actually factoring in the cost of rent, professional development, insurance, uh, staff costs and all the things that go around their hourly rate, um, which is probably why it's higher than um, you're indicating. But the level of profit probably isn't as, as great as you're indicating. So we, we can, um, yes, that's true. Maybe maybe I went a little bit too far, but if I if the figure that I put there would have been 80, it wouldn't have made any difference in the point uh, that I was making. And you know, we, can, we can go into arguing why is it so much, why is the added cost so much, uh, and, uh, and, and how much professional development ca can you fit into that budget? But yes, fair enough. You know, it, it can be the number can be slightly different. It, and equally, you could argue that eighty-five thousand uh, pounds is quite on the on the higher side of the equation. But you know, fair, fine. So, in that case, not fifty-three, seventy-five. Still the same. Uh, that's not what my math leads to. Okay. One more, one more question. Please. Hooray, thank you very much for, <laughs> for saying a lot of stuff. I've been in patents for 10 years on, as an IP manager and I agree um, with many of the points that you made, particularly the, um, the foreign, uh, foreign agent side of it. I can't understand why when nearly every single technology company in the UK will have to file an American patent, why it's just so expensive to do that. I have to pay a British attorney who then has an American associate and, uh, and the bills get piled up and up and up and there's all this, this middle cost. And, uh, and I, I have in the past when I was in a part of a bigger company and we had volumes of scale, we did push the patent attorneys for massive reductions. We insisted on certain foreign agent firms. We created a reciprocal network and we stripped out a huge amount of the cost by doing that. So it's possible if you ask. I entirely agree with your point. And I think it's a shame for small companies. You're very much hamstrung by the fact that you don't have the sort of buying power to, to get much of a reduction from patent attorneys. And the other side that um, you really get hamstrung with is renewal costs. Uh, you didn't mention that, but um, patent attorneys often provide a service for renewing patents, and essentially they're already outsourcing it to big firms like CPA Global or CPI, and they're, they're then who they already pat, uh, provide a service charge on top of the patent office fee, and then your patent attorney is going to charge you on top of that, and it's just cost upon cost upon cost. And if you are a savvy IP manager, you can reduce a lot of that cost, but. Yeah, you, you have to work hard at it. So I, I thank you very much. Um, it's very nice when someone, when someone agrees with you. Uh, it doesn't happen very often. <laughs> um, so with, with respect to US, uh, US costs, so the US market is, is 
has, I think, that maybe 50,000, maybe I got the number wrong, but uh, maybe 50,000 registered patent attorneys in all shapes and sizes and qualities of, uh, of, of service. And um, uh, without going to the detail of how reciprocal arrangements work and why there is no incentive uh, to work with, with less expensive firms, what I, what I can say from my experience is that the price differences, especially in the US, more than anywhere else probably, maybe Japan, are massive. They're just huge. And can a, can a small company uh, save a, a, a lot of money by uh, being a more informed customer? Absolutely. It's not just for big companies. Yes, there is some leverage in being a, a big company, but small companies can do quite a lot. And not only save, they can get more attention and better service uh, when they work with, uh, when they m make themselves not for granted. Um, as for renewals, I, I think some some firms would still handle renewals. I think that quite a lot of the firms would say pick a renewal company. If they, you want to, you want the, don't want to pick a renewal company, pick CPA. Not sure. Well, it, historical thing really, but um, uh, there are lots of other renewal companies, not just CPA. And uh, I, I always thought that's the right thing to do. You know why 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 should why should a, a, an organization that hires PhD aces uh, deal with something that's completely technical and computerized and something that they c they're clearly not the best but in the best position uh, to deal with. So if, if your patent firm tells you your patent is granted, take these patents away and put them in a cheap renewal company, I think that's a good sign. Uh, if they're making 200 pounds or whatever on each renewal, they, they should consider that this is not a f good future profit stream and it comes on the expense of at some point, their clients realizing that this is not something that they're, they're supposed to do. But here is being blunt again. So thank you very much. And uh, yeah. Thank you for that <coughs> thought-provoking discussion. <laughs> If, if you can get me qualified patent attorneys at £85,000 each, I'll pay your recruitment fee on top of that. Anyway, um, right, just moving on to uh, our next panel session is uh, Who Owns the Problem? Responsibility and Management of IP in a Fast-Growing Company. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, my partner, uh, Alex Brown, from Venice Shipley. Thank you.